Oh yeah. New Smith & Wesson, pretty cool Hickok 45 here. Showing you a new invention, new revolver, the newest idea from Smith & Wesson. But you haven't seen one this easy to load in a long time. Pretty cool, huh? Top brake. I just came up with it the other day. Click. <laughs> yes, let's open him up. Pretty cool. Yes, it is Hickok 45 with a top brake Smith & Wesson. Uh, the newest invention. You probably haven't seen it. I got one sent to me as a T&E gun uh, because it just came out. And uh, I just had that relationship with Smith & Wesson. So when they invented it uh, about a month ago, they got one of the early models to me. Did you believe that? <laughs> Didn't think you would. Well, believe it or not, this was pretty hot invention uh, at one point in time. Uh, <laughs> yes, sir. Let's go back to 1870. Yes, Model 3. Smith & Wesson. Uh, iconic revolver. Uh, it doesn't get as much attention as it really should because all of us old guys grew up on cult single actions and watching westerns and you just didn't see as many of them in the movies uh, for various reasons but they were actually out there because Smith & Wesson made a lot of them. Quite a few. Most I guess went to Russia. They made a lot of them for Russia under a big contract. But they were out there. A lot of the famous outlaws you could name, you know, carried these things. I think Jesse James carried one. Uh, and it's rumored that Wyatt Earp and, I mean, everybody under the sun basically had one. And you know how that goes. Nobody knows for sure in most cases. So, pretty cool. 1870, you know, that kind of action. You must have to ask, you have to ask yourself, uh, wow, especially if you're not familiar with it. Why didn't I know about that? Uh, because in 1870, I thought everybody was still carrying around percussion revolvers like this. You know, right here, most of the cavalry in 1870 had one of these in a holster. How's that for a, uh, how's that for a contrast? You saw how this worked, I, even with my fumble fingers and very little experience uh, with it. Uh, and you know what it requires to load one of these. You know, you got load the cylinder from the front, and you've got your plunger, you put powder in, and then you put the ball in and you shove it down, and you put a cap back here on the nipple. For each chamber, you have to do that. And then you finally have it loaded, all right? Well, again, 1870, most people would have been carrying one of those because it was 1873 before the classic Colt single action. 45 Colt came into being, all right? So 1873, so we're talking uh, two or three years before that. Good old Smith & Wesson has this sucker out on the market, okay? You might not have been aware of that. And what I want to do was give you kind of the big picture because I want to make this educational if at all, if all possible. I know just enough to be dangerous uh, about these things. And there's books and books and books written on them. Uh, by the, what is it, Roy Jinks, I think, has written extensively, you know, from Smith & Wesson. Uh, Mike Venturino, I have all of his books. I've read most of his articles in the gun magazines over the years. He has a great book, Guns of the West, and uh, I think that's what it's called, Guns of the West, I have it. Uh, but, uh, and then Colt Peacemakers, a lot of good books on these old guns. But uh, the Smith & Wesson model uh, number three is one that doesn't probably get enough attention. If you go to gun shows, big gun shows, you'll see them there, the old ones, you know, and you wonder, well, why haven't I seen that in a Western? And you do occasionally, but, uh, but not nearly as often as we really should, okay? So what I wanna do, there were several models of it. I wanna give you kind of an overview. And uh, from 1870 on up into uh, 1900s, early 1900, 1912, 1915, these guns were made, these big bore, top brake, Smith & Wessons were manufactured, okay? Now they come under different names. You've got the Schofield, you've got the, the new Model 3 and all that, but they're basically the same. There's not much difference and uh, you know, you can read all about those differences and I'll point out a couple of those. Now this one shoots high and uh, a lot of the old guns do. I load, I'm loading five just so I don't develop bad habits. You know, let's hammer down on an empty chamber. If you're gonna carry it like I am, in my holster, you know, I have five rounds, just like a Colt, it's safer that way. It's got five big rounds. Even got a holster for this baby recently. Uh, 
pretty cool at the Louisville Gun Show for the Schofield. Doesn't really work well or fit well in most of the Colt holsters, so it's a little bit different. Uh, it you know, works in a Schofield holster because they're essentially the same gun, it's a Model 3. Okay, so it shoots high, and I want to express my appreciation to Taylors and Company for sending this to us. It's a T&E gun and they have access to all kinds of cool Western guns. So I actually contacted them and they were so kind as to let us borrow one. So we really appreciate that because I love these old guns that I know a lot of you do too. And I hope that all of you will. I can help uh, spread the fever. Boom. <laughs> oh man, it feels good. You have to hold down below what you're trying to hit. Like, uh, oh, that pot. I hold right on the bottom of it. Yeah, caught him in the middle. Let's try that two liter. Oh, uh, they probably shot a lot of two liters with these guns back in the day. Yep, click. Okay. And then, again, as I was so unexpertly showing you at the beginning here, uh, you just put it on half cock, like that, and you push up, uh, you can grab it like this, or you can use your thumb, as you saw me doing, and these will pop out, you can dump them out. If you do it fast, they'll fly out, generally speaking. All right, now, 45 Colt doesn't have much of a rim on it, so sometimes they don't catch as well. That's one of the uh, disadvantages of having one of these in 45 Colt, uh, because back in the day, uh, well, we'll talk about that, but most of these were in 44 of some, some variation. So, is that a cool gun or not? I mean, in a way, I think I even mentioned this in the Luger video, uh, that that gun, it, it, it harkened back and reminded me of this, this kind of thing. Whether you like these or not, if you just, you know, oh man, I have no use for that, give me a good old single action Colt or clone. They're just fascinating how they work. Because look how easy that is to load. Pop them in as you've seen, close her up, fire the rounds, then you open it, and it ejects the rounds, see? Pretty cool, and if you don't want to eject the rounds, let's say I have it loaded, and I just want to check my rounds for some reason, or unload it, whatever, I can hold the ejector down here, extractor, and it doesn't pop out, see? See, a lot of control over it. That's not bad, is it? For 1870, the old boys at Smith & Wesson, pretty clever. And you do know that Smith & Wesson, I'll load it up again, I'll just keep shooting the darn thing, because I like to shoot. Uh, but the old boys at Smith & Wesson, you know, they're the ones who came up with the first cartridge revolvers, the 22s, you know, back in 18, what, 57, something? And, uh, and then the 32 caliber uh, that a lot of guys carried in the Civil War. And now it was a little different. It, it, instead of breaking down like this, it broke up. It had a hinge up here, and it opened upward. You took the cylinder out and reloaded it. And they made those and sold thousands of those things. Uh, and then, but they knew in the 1860s that after the Civil War, that uh, they were going to be wanting to make a big bore uh, revolver using cartridges because they owned all the patents for the uh, board through cylinders, uh, the, uh, what Roland White uh, uh, patent. So they were able to make uh, cartridge guns back in the 1850s, whereas Colt couldn't and no one else really could. And so they needed a couple more uh, patents they had to buy in the 60s, I think for this, uh, this latch system and this hinge system. And, and then the extraction system before they could make this gun. But they got the rights to those patents in the 1860s, and then around like 69, they went into production. This thing was, uh, was ready to go in 1870. So pretty cool, because uh, we, we forget about that time frame, because 73 is the big year when all those cartridges came out in the Colt revolvers, but uh, Smith uh, and Wesson were actually ahead of the game. Well, let's just take a couple of shots two-handed here. Modern style. <laughs> uh, now it shoots high, but I'm gonna try to hit the gong. I'm gonna have to hold, I think, down in the dirt. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Pretty cool. Big old 45 slugs. So let me see if I can bear down on one of those uh, two liters there. I think the windage is pretty close. If I can get a good trigger break. <laughs> well, at least I scared him off. Let's see if I can do more on the other one. <laughs> well, not with a flinch like that. Okay, then you got to half cock it. And there you go. I'll dump them over here. Pretty neat.
pretty neat. Oh yes. Uh, so, you know, Smith and Wesson basically had the market on the, the big bore uh, cartridge uh, handgun. They really did. And uh, they made about a thousand of these, I think, for the U.S. Army. Now, the U.S. Army uh, liked it. They really liked it and, and bought some of them. But they didn't want the uh, rimfire cartridges. I've got some cartridges I bought at the Louisville Gun Show. It just worked out great. This first one here, oops, knocked him over. That is a Henry rimfire cartridge. I had to pay 40 bucks for that thing. Uh, but that is, that's an old one. It's a copper case on it. See? So that goes way back. That's the early model uh, for the rimfire. You know, no center fire. It, it looks like it does, but it's not. It's a rimfire case that's what uh, the old Henry you know this brass frame receiver rifles used okay and then there was later a little different version of it okay then so that's what it was chambered for initially when they first made it but the uh, army wanted a uh, center fire round and that's what you got here in the second one that's a 44 see the prime now these were from a display board they have holes in them so there's no powder or anything in them but uh, that is the 44 American it became known as later uh, 44 100 I think at the time they, they designated it it was just the 44 and uh, so the military was happier with that center fire and everything 44 caliber you got your primer there now you notice something about that it's like a 22 you notice it's a heel type bullet that's why I have the 22s out here the lead is the same diameter as the brass you know they're, they're the same and if you look at a gun that's chambered for that, and you look down into the cylinder or ran a cleaning patch through it, it would just be like a pipe. You know, you know how when you clean your whatever it is, your semi-automatic or your revolver, once you get past the chamber, it tightens up a little bit because the bore is a little tighter. Well, not so with that. That's a heel-tight bullet, like a 22. Okay, uh, but but it worked. There's a bunch of these things that were chambered for that round. It was called the tw the uh, 44 American. Now, the reason it was called the 44 American was because uh, Smith & Wesson got some big contracts with the Russian uh, folks in the Army, and they wanted a new kind of bullet. So we can thank them for coming up with the one you're looking at there. That is more like the 44 Special, 44 Magnum. It's not the heel-type bullet. It's, it's set down into the case. And when you have that heel-type bullet, you just have kind of a shank to hold it into the case, uh, and it's lubed on the outside. And the lube picks up dirt and everything, and so it's not ideal. And the Russians uh, figured out that they wanted the bullet to be, uh, you know, seated down in the case, and the lube grooves to be, you know, down in the case, and where you don't collect dirt and everything. And you know, <laughs> the rest is history. That's that's the way uh, most bullets are now, and most cartridges and, uh, and revolver cartridges. So that's the 44 Russian, extremely popular, extremely popular. Probably uh, of the entire range of these Model 3 Smiths when they were made from 1870 on into the 1900s, more of them were chambered for the 44 Russian than anything else, I'd be my guess. And it's known as a very accurate round. And the only difference between that and a 44 Special really is the 44 Special is a little bit bigger. I think in 1907 uh, it was lengthened to make the 44 Special and then in what, 55 was it, the 44 Magnum, all the same. You know, I've got some other guns out here. I could actually fire that in my 44 Magnum. Uh, that's a 44 Special, and that's an original. If it was a real bullet, see, a Chambers, it's just short. Just like I could put a 44 Special in there or a Magnum. So it's just a shorter 44. But it's got the same type of bullet. Pretty cool, huh? So just wanted to show you the difference there between that because when I mention uh, some of these and what they were chambered for, you'll have a better idea. The, the 44 American was the first one. Well, no, the, the Rimfire uh, Henry actually was the first one, but they didn't make that many of them or as many. The 44 American was uh, very popular, and a lot of bad guys and good guys carried that, no doubt about it. But then when the Russians got involved, and they bought so many of them, uh, they dictated the round for sure, and it became very popular in this country too. Okay, so I got an empty chamber. Yes. Let's try that propane tank. Now I've got a holster here, kind of a cross straw. Uh, like I said, I put it on as cross straw. It's not really a cross straw a holster. So yeah, it's single action, and of course it's not a, it's not a Sig, it's not a Glock. But as long as you're careful, you don't shoot yourself, you know, in cross straw. You can still get a hold of it, cock it, boom. You know, you're not exactly unarmed with a single action. Let's do that again. 
okay? I'm not using the sights, I'm just pointing and I don't even, you know, I haven't even shot this gun that much, but it, it feels pretty good. Boom, single action, nice, nice. Okay, half cock, pull up the, okay, there they go, the empties. Okay, now you're familiar with the Schofield. This is not a Schofield, it looks like the Schofield. Uh, the, uh, the, the American was made for a couple years, and then uh, George Schofield, Major Schofield, he was with the cavalry. He decided that this would be great for the cavalry if, if, you could, uh, if the latch was mounted on the frame. You notice this is mounted on the, the barrel up here, you know, so it's not on frame. But, so that's, if you see a Schofield, you may have one, you know the big difference is the latch is on the frame, so you could more easily work it with your thumb. You can actually work that one pretty well with your thumb. But you can just pull on that, pull it back. I had one way back 15 years ago. And, uh, and you're on horseback, you can't, you know, you're shooting off a horseback, of course, then you just break it down with, without getting your left hand into it, inject the shells, then grab it. You got your reins in one hand, your reins in the gun too, and you can, you know, refill it from your cartridge box or something, you know, and then you're back in action. And you still got to hold the reins with one hand. So he, uh, that was his idea, and he had that patented. And so for a couple of years, they made the Schofield. And that's the one that's most famous, probably because maybe, I don't know, the military adopted it, and they bought quite a few of them. Uh, not all that many. But they bought quite a few of them, and it's the one we're most familiar with, probably. But it was a Model 3. I mean, there's not that much difference. Uh, and then uh, they got uh, Smith & Wesson got tired of paying. Uh, the military dropped it, pretty much, because of the ammo incompatibility. And got tired of paying Schofield uh, royalties for that idea and that patent. And they went back to, to this system in 78, 1878. And they made the new Model 3, which is what this is. And the new Model 3 is generally considered, of all the Model 3s, to be kind of the epitome of this top break revolver, maybe any single action revolver uh, of the uh, 19th century. Okay, let's take a couple more shots. Empty chamber? Yeah. All right. Okay, I got a two liter, I'm after charge to get him. I'm going to try that red one. All right. I might even try that when it's down. He thinks he got away. He probably did. I know he didn't. Back to wallet. So like I said, the Schofield's the one you're most familiar with, probably. But uh, that was really just a couple of years they made that. They're all Model 3s. That's, that's the thing I want you to take away from this, the, these top breaks. The, the American, and the reason it was called the American, and that cartridge is called the 44 American, was because it wasn't called that, I don't think, until we ended up with the 44 Russian cartridge, see? So, so that was the differentiate. The 44 American was a heel-type bullet, like a 22, as I discussed, and then the the Russian round was more like our modern you know, rounds. Uh, and then the Schofield. Now the Schofield was actually chambered in 45. It was in 40, like this one, 45. Uh, but it didn't have as long a cylinder. Uh, they, Smith, I think, told the military they could make it in 45 Colt, but they really couldn't or didn't. And so what Smith and Wesson did was they came up with a uh, 45 Smith and Wesson and it's often called the 45 Schofield round because it's shorter. It's like a 45 special or something, okay? In fact, I bought two of these, and that's what these are. This was a really early one with a copper copper case, and it's actually centerfire. This guy that collects cartridges I bought these from was telling me it doesn't look like it is, but it is, the centerfire. And uh, I guess it acts just like a rim fire, but the, uh, the mercury or whatever is in the, the middle. That's a really old one. And then this is a little bit newer, and by Peters, there you can see, 45 Smith & Wesson S&W. And this would actually fire in this gun. It's a little expensive to fire, but it would see a chamber. It's just a shorter 45. All right. So, a little more history, uh, not to bore you. So, so we had two cartridges. The military bought a bunch of the Schofields. We're talking Schofield now, 45 caliber. And, of course, they already had the Colt Single Action Army adopted. And then we, we throw with a Schofield into the mix that's a 45 caliber also, but it will not fire these. They're, they're too long for the cylinder. 
So, but that's no problem. We got lots of Schofield. You know, it's another cartridge. You know, they, so the Army bought lots of those too. Well, you can guess what happened. Some outpost or who knows where they got a shipment of ammo and they got the wrong ammo or somebody's in the field and they're out there, you know, in combat or fighting, and they've got a uh, Schofield. And the only ammo that's around is the long Colt, you know, and it won't work in their guns. It's like being uh, without ammo, totally. You know, so that's probably the main reason they axed the Schofield, because this, this ammo compatibility issue, and that just wasn't going to work. So thus ended the career of the uh, <laughs> Schofield revolver, uh, more or less. But in 78, after that, uh, Smith & Wesson went back to the old latch system, and they upgraded some things, they improved some things, they changed the angle of the grip a little bit. Uh, I think they shortened the ejector housing in here, uh, and it just felt better. Uh, I had a Schofield, and it didn't feel as good as this one. So this is a new model. Like I say, it's a new model, number three. And this happens to be a, a, a specific subset of the Model 3s. It's a, uh, a Frontier model. And Smith & Wesson just made a couple of thousand of these. And it didn't sell all that well. They chambered it for the 4440. And I think that's probably the reason. Because the, the new models sold well. And most of them were chambered for the 44 Russian. And I think that's what it was. People had gotten used to this 44 Russian being a very accurate, famous for being very accurate. Actually, that's the American. And, uh, and, and pleasant to shoot. So I think that was probably the reason. But uh, anyway... They're all Model 3s, the American, the Russian models, the Schofield, uh, this one, they're Model 3s, uh, new Model 3s, this one is, and they all kind of work the same way. They're, they're really cool guns. In fact, they're so cool, I'm going to put a couple more rounds through this thing. Now, on the replicas, they, uh, they lengthen the cylinder for the 45 Colt, because, again, uh, here I am shooting 45 Colt while I'm telling you that these were not chambered for, for 45 Colt. Well, 45 Colt's a very popular caliber, isn't it? And so it's like with the lever guns, uh, the Uberti I have that is a uh, remake of the 1873 Winchester. It's chambered in 45 Colt because it's such a popular round. It was around back in the day, and you know, they just didn't chamber it for those back then. And uh, but now we do. But they extend the cylinder, make it a little bit longer, and with black powder, it gets clogged up a little, a little faster. You don't have as much of a gap there, and there's a little seal there to help, uh, you know, on the originals. But I may shoot a black powder round, or I may not. But uh, they, they will work with either. It's just they get gummed up much faster than the originals did. Okay, and they didn't have a can of ballistol handy to thaw it out. <laughs> oh, I'm gonna put it in the holster again. I'm gonna go to the empty chamber. Okay. All right. What have we got? Oh, we got a cowboy. <laughs> Pretty cool. I like this gun. Nice, nice. Got to be careful with the cross draw now. I know when you're when you're in a cowboy match. Uh, I started out when I was doing cowboy shooting, I had a cross draw and a regular, and I kind of got away from it and had this two right. You really have to, you notice I'm putting my arm back here when I do that, because when you pull out of a cross draw, you tend to be sweeping parts of your body or maybe other people that you don't want to sweep. You know, it's like a shoulder holster. So uh, just be careful if you're doing that. You know, in a cowboy match, they tell you a lot of people wear them. They're around here like this, kind of like that. They look cool and they're really accessible. You know, especially if you're at the poker table, you're Doc Holliday, you know, and you got to have your gun handy. <laughs> but you pull that thing out and you look what you got if you're not careful. See, you would be pointing at a couple of people sitting over there having a soft drink, watching the match or something, you know. So they, they tell you to turn around like this when you draw, you know, and that kind of takes care of that, that issue, generally speaking. So, but it is fun to use a cross draw holster. So I don't want to bore you too much, but I wanted to give you kind of a big picture how we, uh, how we came to have this revolver, and I didn't put out the empties yet. Half cock. Let's throw them out fast. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Again, this is the top break big bore Smith & Wesson. Uh, you know, it's a replica from Taylors & Company, made by you, Birdie, imported by Taylors & Company. And again, we sure appreciate getting this thing. It's, it's so cool. Uh, all of these were 
essentially the same gun with just different lengths barrel, a little bit of difference in the sights. Uh, when uh, I think Taylor's actually kind of gave you Bertie the specs on this one, it's basically a, a new model three, you know, Frontier, but they, they put the little uh, cylinder retaining screw on the top like the Russian models have, and it's got a little bit better sight and uh, it's not chambered in 4440 so it's not exactly authentic either they kind of took the best of the, some of the new model model 3 firearms and uh, had kind of a special run of these made so it's it's pretty cool it, it feels so good it feels so much better than the uh, the Schofield and I love the barrel length this is five I think it comes in six and a half you know as well but uh, the big deal was the board through cylinders you know we, we forget sometimes you got to have something you got to own the patent rights in order to to make something and Colt didn't own the patent rights, so they could not make a gun like this until 72, I think, when they did their top breaks, their open tops, whatever they're called. Uh, Smith could. They were making them all through the 50s and even the 60s, but big time right here in, in 1870s when it really started with them. So pretty cool. Quite a stretch from this, huh? <laughs> and just think, so many people were carrying one of these things and loading with it and, and loading it and using that, depending on it, when this came out. Because we're three years away for the good old Colt single action. So anyway, not represented enough in uh, in Hollywood uh, and probably in uh, in fiction of any kind. But a very popular pistol. If we could all go back in time, we would see people carrying these around the streets of Dodge or wherever, uh, and uh, and and loving them. They really would. So. Hopefully it gives you a little information, kind of just a ballpark, uh, enough to whet your appetite. Uh, you might want to read some more about them. Uh, they're, they're just cool guns, fun to shoot, fascinating to see how they operate and, and how they shoot. And again, most of them were in 44, you know, 44 Ren Fire, 44 American with the heel type bullet, and then especially 44 Russian, a great, great cartridge, really great cartridge. And uh, these are fascinating firearms. So I am glad to be able to bring to you, and I am especially glad to be able to fire the thing and enjoy it. Life is really good.